Welcome everyone. Uh, good morning or good evening for those of you down um, in Australia, New Zealand and that part of the world. And very early good morning from anyone who's coming in from um, the Americas. I, don't, I can't see anyone at the moment. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Christina Lester-Bendana and I'm a professor of politics at Leeds University in the UK and I'm chair of IPEN, the International Parliament Engagement Network, which co-hosts with the IPU, the public engagement network, the public engagement hub. Um, and it's my real pleasure to welcome you all to the seminar on processing citizen engagement input for committee work with a focus on New Zealand and Scotland as case studies. And this seminar is part of a series of seminars we've been put, putting through since May last year, which explores issues of public engagement with Parliament following the publication at the time of the Global Parliamentary Report on public engagement uh, by the IPU and the UNDP. So before introducing today's topic and, and speakers, just a few house, house uh, keeping rules. The seminar is being translated into French or from French and Spanish. So if you wish to have translation, or actually I think it's better if you do uh, choose your language because there might be questions in the language that you don't necessarily know. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see an icon for interpretation. If you just choose your language that you wish this, the seminar to be in, then everything should be fine. Um, throughout the seminar, if you keep your mic muted, unless you are uh, speaking, asking questions, and you're really, really welcome to have uh, your cameras on. We really like to see faces. Um, and so if you have a good network and, and it's okay for you to have your cameras on, then please do so. So introducing um, the topic today, Answer is being brave and putting the camera on. Thank you so much. It's really nice to see faces. Uh, anyone who's been a, a teacher or lecturer during the pandemic and had to teach a, a whole bunch of you know, um, squares with no faces will know how important it is to see faces when we are online. So uh, today's topic. So we're focusing on how uh, parliaments sort of process, consider all the inputs brought in by citizens. Because as parliaments develop more channels to for public input, we, we're having more and more cases of parliaments bringing in um, the input from citizens, submit their views, but many parliaments are then faced with the challenge of actually processing those inputs, either because they obey large volumes of comments or because often the, the, the deadlines, the timings are very, very tight and the processes to deal with evidence in Parliament are not necessarily the most helpful. So there's all sorts of different issues on why just opening up channels for, for citizens does not necessarily mean that it's just you know, job done by any means whatsoever. And we know this is a real challenge. So we have a two, uh, two seminars on this topic. Uh, one will take place in, in, in May, which I'll talk about and I'll announce at the end of the seminar. And today we're focusing specifically on processing uh, citizens' inputs linking to committees. And we're focusing on the case studies of New Zealand and the Parliament of Scotland. And we'll reflect on their own approaches, some of the challenges they have faced. And um, and there should be plenty of time for, for questions also. So I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers now. So I'm going to introduce first Catherine, Catherine Farmer, um, who's a senior business analyst at the office of the Clerk of the House of Representatives in New Zealand. And Catherine's role is very much about providing advice on IT systems that support Parliament. And, and very, very importantly for the seminar today, in 2020, Catherine actually engaged and took a piece of research on the specific topic that we're talking about today, about getting meaningful information from ever increasing numbers of submissions and with integrity and transparency for the work of Parliament. And Alice Estordat, Senior Participation Specialist at Participation and Communities team at the Scottish Parliament. Uh, that team focuses on involving the public in the work with Parliament. Uh, with a particular focus on supporting committee engagement. And those of you who follow the Scottish Parliament, you'll know there's a lot of experience in there in, in engaging the public and bringing the inputs from the public. And much of Ali's role is about increasing democratic innovation and is it responsible for developing the Parliament's digital 
uh, participation processes and embedding also deliberative engagement, such as randomly selected citizens assemblies, panels into the work of parliament. So two speakers with lots and lots of experience in this area. Um, and before, um, so just to explain how we're going to do it before we're going to, we're going to listen first to Alice's presentation about Scottish Parliament and then Catherine will come in with home reflections and experiences from New Zealand. And they'll have a 15 minute presentation each and then we'll open up for Q&A. So without further ado, um, Ali, can you, Going first and share yep. your thoughts. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Christina. And thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody uh, here today. I'm just going to bring up my slides. So uh, hopefully you should be able to see that all OK. Yeah, we can um, see that. Excellent. So I'm Ali. As Christina says, I work at the Scottish Parliament and focusing on digital engagement today uh, and predominantly around how we process sort of uh, larger numbers of um, of submissions. So a digital engagement at the uh, at the Scottish Parliament um, folks, we've got, we use two platforms predominantly for digital engagement. Uh, one is a platform I'll talk to you a little bit about at the end called Your Priorities, which is more like a sort of uh, public forum platform that we use for a range of uh, more kind of innovative processes like question generation or shaping the work of committees, uh, but also scrutinising legislation. And then we have uh, Citizen Space, which is our standard uh, consultation uh, management system that we use to process our cost reviews when committees are, um, uh, you know, wanting in input from the public and stakeholders. Um, so, in terms of Citizen Space, we've been we tried it for a number of years last session, and this parliamentary session, which started in May 2021, it's now used by all 16 uh, committees at the Scottish Parliament. And so far, the session, so just coming up to uh, a couple of years now, we've got um, over uh, 120 COFs reviews have been processed, and over 27,000 responses have been received. Um, so the use of citizen space at the Scottish Parliament uh, has led to increased participation uh, from the public in our cost reviews. So that 27,000 figure is markedly increased on um, on uh, you know what we would have previously. Uh, there's more efficiency. Uh, in uh, the administration of the cost reviews, everything is in the same place and everyone can kind of do what they need to do with, with the information. And it has allowed more flexibility in how we approach uh, cost reviews. Uh, but um, what happens if we get uh, overwhelmed uh, by responses, you might ask? Uh, what if there is a high interest call for views on a polarising uh, subject? How do we ensure that all voices are uh, taken into account? Um, so one example I want to use using our um, citizen space platform was the Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill. Um, so... Uh, that bill um, basically would make it an offence uh, to hunt uh, wild mammals using a dog, except in limited circumstances. And as you all know, a bill uses uh, technical language, so we needed to find ways to ensure that the public could engage in a meaningful way with the bill, as well as you know stakeholders that would be very much engaged in, in the process of it going through uh, the legislature. So we decided to take an approach of sort of having two options. So we had a short survey, uh, which uh, included 17 quantitative questions and then one qualitative question. And then we also had a detailed consultation, which had 29 qualitative questions, which detailed specific parts of the bill, different provisions in the bill. And participants had the option whether they wanted to complete the short survey or if they wanted to complete the detailed consultation about the bill. Uh, we used, within Citizen Space, you can use a mechanism called a fact bank, which is effectively an accordion menu where you click on it and then it expands and provides more uh, detail. So that was able to be used to show all of the questions in advance to participants. So they had an informed opinion about which uh, process they would like to take part in. And then also it's really useful, as I mentioned about the technical language, we were able to then explain terms in more detail and in clearer ways. So for example, there was a 
in uh, section one three of the bill there's a definition of a wild mammal and then we're able within the context of that question uh, have an option to explain what that was so people can make an informed decision about about the response they wanted to give um, so as a result of, of this process, um, we received 71 responses to the detailed call for views, uh, including uh, 23 from organisations and 48 from individuals. And then we received the only 2,700 responses to the shorter survey. So you can see quite a marked uh, difference in the, in the input. But um, the 71 is probably what we maybe traditionally receive for a detailed qualitative consultation. Uh, consultation and then yeah 2700 quite a large amount of, of information that we had to, to process and look at so what do we do in order to to make sure that's meaningful for members and for the public to take part in it, such a process um so for the analysis the the 71 uh, detailed responses were were summarized and provided as evidence to the, the committee so we have uh we have the the, the scottish parliament's information center which is a very trusted um, in, um independent um research uh, team within within the parliament and they 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 provide uh, that that type of support so they were able to, to process that um and then with and then they produce a paper and that goes to the committee and then with the 2700 survey responses and um, the quantitative responses were provided in full and we were able to process that and give them the results but then we still had you know a lot of qualitative responses and what we did was we uh, the the, the the, uh, the Information Centre at Parliament uh, and, and myself worked together to use automated tools and uh, sampling to look at the qualitative responses and then be able to tell a story of, 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 of that information and give that to members. So there was a number of challenges with this uh, particular uh, process that I just wanted to highlight. One is around the location of uh, participants. So you can see from this uh, chart here, uh, about a third of participants came from outside of Scotland uh, because, uh, you know, uh, animal welfare or the, uh, the, you know, people that work in the countryside, for example, uh, may have strong opinions about, about, about this issue. And then we also found that areas which had a prevalence of hunting with dogs, uh, so rural areas in Scotland like the Scottish Borders, Dumfries and Galloway Highlands, etc., uh, were more likely to take part. But we did receive participation from across Scotland uh, in this process. And also you've got to think about networked campaigns, so you might use jargon like astroturfing or, uh, you know, people doing kind of uh, digital postcard uh, campaigns, uh, which sort of magnifies the issue further. So all of that needs to be taken into consideration when looking looking at uh, issues like this, uh, polarised issues. So what we did obviously was to provide information um, about whether or not um, the participants supported the bill, but we wanted to focus on the fact that this wasn't a, uh, you know, a stratified sample. And in no way was it meant to be a, a you know, a, a, you know, a representative sample. But what we could use it was to show the people that were in favour of the bill, what they thought about it, people that were against the bill, uh, what what they felt, etc. Um, and obviously, if if there's something that's going to change, then maybe you might be more inclined to take part. So two thirds of people that took part were against the bill, but there's some really interesting things that we looked at um, to, to dig into that into more detail and make that useful for the members. Um, so we used um, a statistical uh, software analysis platform using the R um, platform, uh, which uh, my colleagues in, in SPICE, the, the data visualization team, did and we were able to kind of filter the data based on responses to different questions uh, and um, obviously we looked at what people were generally saying in res in relation to people that supported the bill and okay it's it's just a word cloud and we do a little bit more excited things in a minute but I wanted to just highlight that the people that were in favour of the bill genuinely were supportive of the principles of the bill but actually when you looked at the, the the provisions in more detail they were quite concerned about various what they termed loopholes uh, and and that that was quite interesting and then the people that were against the bill um 
were more thinking about, well, this isn't about hunting for sport. This is actually about wildlife control. This is about how communities in rural areas work and uh, maybe they're being uh, dictated to by people that live in urban communities and, and things like that. So that's the sort of general um, kind of information that we were able to find. But then on top of that, we were all also able to use the software to look at connections between words and words that um, words that appeared together. So um, these are just examples of some of them. So you could the, the, the stronger the arrows are, the more likely that they were able to appear uh, together. Um, so this is this is a, a map of people that were in favour of the bill. And there was things that were quite interesting, uh, like it, it says at the, near the bottom right, it says remove sections four, five and seven. So we were instantly able to see the aspects of the bill in which people um, you know, disliked and wanted to look at in more detail. Uh, and we were also able to, to look at, you know, the, the other themes that would come from that. And then finally, what we did was we we took random samples of, of responses to that final question, which was, you know, qualitative aspects of what they thought about the bill. And then we were able to kind of match that up and make sure that we could tell a story about what people felt about the bill. Uh, and, and just to highlight, um, again, um, the same but connections but for people against the bill and again I'd highlight in the bottom right for example people talking about communities Scotland's rural community and what that means was like a major theme that, that was coming out for example um, and then yeah as I say we did further analysis so then we were able to highlight uh, key themes to the to the members uh, people that were in favour you know uh, and we highlighted uh, the issues that they raised that they were in favour of the bill and then also things that they wanted to improve the bill. And then likewise, people that were against the bill, we were able to have a really strong uh, list of bullet points around uh, reasons for that. So we were able to take all that information and present that to members in a way that was uh, easy for them to understand. And it gave a good snapshot of what people felt about, about that bill. And um, so all of that information was used to inform the questioning of witnesses and the final report. Uh, and um, uh, I can, happy to kind of share if people are interested I'm happy to share the the analysis that we did and, and we provided to members and so on um, and then we also had because obviously a bill is complicated there was a particular uh, provision in the bill around the practice of rough shooting uh, which is where you use uh, I believe you use dogs to kind of flush out um, particular animals and um, we got additional responses from the, the public so 232 responses to a very specific question so because we'd done that quite large engagement before we were able to double down on that and have people participate uh, further. Um, so that was that one example of a kind of traditional cost review process and in the time that I've got left I'm just going to speak about the um, your priorities online discussion platform that we have um, which is a more informal uh, user-friendly interface and it's kind of like an online forum I suppose and participants use it maybe to either add ideas or in this example respond to ideas or provisions and rate them and comment on them and we've used it over the last number of years we've had six and a half thousand users use it to generate questions for committees or shape committee work or share lived experience about the impact of government policy and, and scrutinise legislation. Um, so in the scrutiny of legislation, we, one example is the fireworks and pyrotechnics bill. So we set up this Your Priorities uh, platform with clear information about each provision in the bill that needed um, sort of scrutiny. And then participants could go into each of those provisions and read more detailed information and then see whether they like to dislike the provision and then provide comments for or comments against the provision. And then that was all analysed and again using similar techniques and then that was able to be have an issues paper put directly to members uh, on that. So You've this got is a couple of minutes left now, yep. Ali. No problem. Um, I'll speed up. But this is the this is a screenshot of the um of of the the platform, and you can see that there's different uh, windows with the different provisions. If we were to click on the police powers to stop and search, we then go in have more information on that and then you can see it, the you know, people can like and dislike it but also it's the uh, users are encouraged to explain why they agree or disagree with the provision so you can see at the bottom there that the the columns are uh, split so that you're not having this idea of a flame war people arguing underneath the line that it's this they're separated and that makes it easy to analyze so then in the end we were able we had 
1,400 people took part in this and uh, 11,000 ratings and we were able to summarise all that and the little document on the top right there is, is the kind of paper that we produced to members and then that was able to go through looking at each provision in turn and looking at comments that supported uh, this part of the bill, areas that were in opposition to that part of the bill and issues that were uh, to improve the bill. So. Um, that, that's another way that we've used that, this process to take mass participation and make it manageable for members. Uh, and members found it really useful. They felt that it was a good way for, uh, that the public could understand the provisions. And then it provided a clear message to the Committee on Public Opinion. And the clerks that supported the committee were also supportive of how the process simplified a bill, made it really user friendly and got people involved in scrutiny of legislation, which can, can feel quite complicated at times. And my last slide, um, as I know I've already one minute left is just to can maybe highlight some of the lessons learned. So given the option of I'm going to a, a lighter touch ways to engage with legislation, uh, it led to increased participation in the work of Parliament. Uh, thinking about the questions that you ask and how the data is collected that influences the story you can tell or how you present that back to uh, members via the use of automated analysis and sampling. And the aim is not to have a representative sample, but to share experiences, questions and concerns the public would have about a bill based on whether they're in favour or against it, and then structuring those outputs in terms of issues raised for and against the bill and showing the improvements can be made to help show all sides of the debate and shows that all views are being heard in that debate. And then the final thing just to think about is about issues such as astroturfing and, and bot attacks when covering issues that are contentious, but I can probably pick that up in the questions afterwards. So thank you very much and I'll stop sharing at that point. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ali. And there's already questions coming in. Uh, one of them, I think, is quite quickly dealt with, although we will have questions after. Ian Walker asks whether you developed this software or if it's commercially available. I'm pretty sure this is commercially available. Yeah, so and there's a number there. of councils and parliaments using it. So, But we'll come to that after. Yeah. Lots of excitement in here. Lots of, lots of okay, excitement. I've managed to generate such excitement. Uh, this yeah. <laughs> Catherine, over to you. Thank you, Christina, and um, greetings to everybody from New Zealand. So I will share my screen. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you. So, um, yeah, as Christina has um, told, uh, I am wanting to talk about how do we cope with the, the deluge of submissions or um, consultation, the, the results of consultation, because we're working so hard to increase participation, but then we have to have the other side of how do we deal with the results of that. Um, so as Christina said, my name is Catherine Farmer and I work at the Office of the Clerk in the New Zealand Parliament. And I recently did um, a Masters of Information Management degree and my main final research topic was on this very subject. So it's something I have taught, I talk a lot about and think a lot about. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just gonna move my zoom. I can't see. So really what I wanted to talk today is about how the increasing number of submissions that we get on a bill has changed the way that members now get information um, and I want to talk about how digital tools can be used to support members getting that information, which I think has been, um, we've seen examples of that with Alistair's presentation. And finally, I really want to kind of go through the principles and standards to be thinking about, um, to underpin whatever that process is to get members information or to use those digital tools. So if we go back in time, 20 years ago, you know, the call for submissions would be made in the newspaper, you'd get them in the, in the post, or you might get some by email, and you might get 10 submissions. And of course, now we can make a call for, the committee can make a call for submissions on a website, um, across the social media channels, then social media channels, of course, they can go out and branch out, lobby groups can go out through their social media channels and so on, and it can really snowball and you might get 10,000 submissions on a bill. So far, 
the maximum number that we've got has been 106,000. So we thought last parliament, we thought we'd hit a, a high amount with 39,000 on a bill and then we had the conversion therapy come through and got 106,000. All with, of course, the same, you know, the same time frames, the same number of people who are working on it, all of the same constraints that we have um, for every bill. So, you know, 20 years ago, it was a really reasonable expectation that every member in a committee would read every single submission. Um, but now you can't possibly expect committee members to be able to do that when we're getting submissions in the thousands. So it's quite a tricky situation because, of course, I mean, if I'm writing a submission to a committee and I'm putting that time and energy in, I want to think that every single person on that committee is reading my submission, they're taking it to heart, they're nodding and thinking this, these are great ideas or really good points. So what do you do to make sure that my submission doesn't just become a data point? What's, so what's happened is that now we can't, you know, members obviously cannot read every, every submission um, and they have to rely on other people or analysts to extract the key information from submissions and provide them with, with essentially a summary of who's saying what. So it's taking the members, you know, that step further apart, step, you know, they're, they're a step away from actually what the submissions are saying. Now, the way that analysts do this, as, as you probably are all aware, is that they will go through and tag the submission. So they'll go through and try and identify what are the themes that they're finding and label all the submissions with these different themes and then pull them together. And this is known as, the practice is known as qualitative analysis. So any kind of analysis of consultation data or participatory data is qualitative um, analysis. And it's very subjective. It's something that you have to make a whole bunch of decisions. So, you know, if you're analyzing a submission, you've got to decide, you know, I think this is a theme. I think this is important. I think this is what the submitter is trying to say. I think this is what their point is. So there's a whole lot of decisions that you make and you can't get away from that because that's part of the process of the analysis of um, trying to understand and interpret what people are saying. And then when you get thousands or tens of thousands of submissions, then potentially you get artificial intelligence that might come into it. And artificial intelligence, really, it's, in many ways, it's not that intelligent <laughs> because it's really just about codified decision making. So, you know, the, your artificial intelligence is kind of going, okay, these are the kinds of decisions that have been made before. I will kind of extrapolate that and go on to make very similar decisions. And so when you get to that situation, you can see how far away a member, committee member, reading a submission and thinking about it has got. Because in, in the end, they may be getting um, something from a machine that's made a whole bunch of decisions that's feeding them this information. Um, so some of the things that we can do to support this or to, to help, I guess, mitigate some of the risks that this causes is we can use text mining tools um, to extract that information from submissions, find ways to still give members ways to engage directly with the submissions rather than sitting around and waiting for somebody else or a computer system to serve things up for them. Um, and also really think about what are the kind of the principles and standards behind the practice of qualitative analysis? Because, you know, qualitative analysis is a whole practice. And I feel like they, we've kind of segued into it potentially without realizing it. Because in the past, you might have been doing, done a summary of submissions and you could actually do that and give it to the members and address every single point that was made in a submission. But then as time's going on and the numbers creep up, this practice has come in but not necessarily understanding the principles and standards that kind of underpin qualitative analysis. Um, and I don't think that's intentional. I think that's just people are trying to do things in a really quick time to get members' information. And then making submissions, you know, when you're giving members reports, 
think about how you can make those reports really consistent and use infographics. And I think we saw that a lot of that with Alistair's um, presentation, the way that you can actually represent submissions at scale using infographics really effectively. Um, so if we kind of look at these individually, so text mining is, it is kind of, it is like a form of, a, um, it's a way of using a machine to go in and find relationships between words. And I think it was really well, it was quite very nicely um, illustrated in Alice's presentation. So a nice, nice follow on for me. And it gives you a nice way to give a bird's eye view of the data so that you can kind of rise above it and kind of get a picture and get a collective view of it. Um, I would kind of make that point that using these tools, it's a good way to support the analysis of the text data, but you can't replace human interpretation because, you know, it's the humans with people who are writing things and we need um, the humans to interpret them. Secondly, looking at those kind of digital tools, if there's ways that you can give members like a dashboard or something so that they get that high level um, representation of what's being said in the submissions and then they can kind of dive in themselves and actually get to the submissions. So I mean, you're giving them an opportunity to engage with the submissions as quickly as possible and also that opportunity to actually get in there and connect directly with the submission rather than waiting for that report. I think this is probably the most important point I'd like to make tonight is that the point the, the practice of the qualitative data analysis, it's subjective because it is about making decisions and interpreting what people are saying. And you can't get away from that. It, it, it's inherently biased, the practice, because people, you know, everybody who's reading a submission, they will bring their own view to it, their own way of thinking about it. Um, but one of the things that you can do to um, mitigate that bias is to bring in transparency. And what I mean by that is that one of the really key principles of qualitative analysis is to be able to report on exactly what you did to create the analysis. So if you can provide within, even within your summary of submissions, information about this is how I approached it, well this is how we approached it, these are the tools that we use, this is how we came up with the, uh, <laughs> the themes. The, you know, if you can show that um, it's being transparent about what happened and it also kind of adheres to the, you know, one of the key principles I think of qualitative data analysis. The other thing I would sort of say, there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other kind of principles which are all around integrity and robustness and, you know, how you approach the data and whatnot. But I guess one of the things that we're starting to work on here in New Zealand is putting together those standards. What are those qualitative analysis standards so that for one thing, the committee can be confident that when they're getting information that they've been done with these principles, they can feel comfortable that if the analysts are using um, artificial intelligence, that they're, they're using certain standards, they're using sort of data, you know, data standards, they're making sure that data is kept private, you know, there's a whole bunch of sort of standards that you can think about. And this is something that we're currently working on here. In terms of like when you're coming up with reports for members, I think that consistency across reports is something that I came across, in, um, certainly came across in my studies, that, you know, we sort of discovered that different groups of analysts would, were coming up with very different reports. And it's really confusing for members who, of course, are all very, very time poor and they need to be able to just get that information really quickly and know where to expect to find things and what it's going to look like. I think that infographics, it's a way to represent large numbers of submissions. If we kind of like think about some of those principles of qualitative analysis, another principle is about really representing, showing 
that you can represent that all views have been heard. I think that's something that Alistair talked about in his presentation. And infographics is one way that you can represent a huge, you know, a really large number of submissions. And it is, it is one way of, you know, in New Zealand, we would say to me, he, the, the submitter, because we want to kind of not lose them out of the equation. Catherine, just a couple of minutes now. Sure, thanks. So conclusion <laughs> is that getting information from large amounts of submissions is now done by qualitative analysis practice. So, you know, in the past, it was like we could read them, we could summarize them, and we could we could put all themes in there, all within a report, or the, or the committees could read it. But now we're using that practice of qualitative analysis, which is that labeling and then synthesizing and pulling through the views. We can use digital tools to support qualitative analysis to give members, um, ac you know, direct access to submissions because they, um, they've become separated from those submissions, but if we can find ways to bring them back in and get them to engage directly with submissions. And, so, and, we, and if we can acknowledge that we are using qualitative analysis, then it's good for us to understand what are those standards and what are those principles and methodologies of qualitative data analysis so that we're doing this with principles and we're using transparency and integrity in what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Again, so much in there. Um, we could be here the whole day really talking about this. Um, something we haven't really spoken about is actually the processes in terms of the legislation, you know, parliamentary processes and adapting those processes, which obviously is very important. But hopefully that will come up in the, in, in the, in the questions. So I've got a couple of questions um, in the chat, but if anyone else wants to ask questions, you could click on raise your hand, which should be available at the bottom of your screen and the uh, reactions, and I'll bring you in. If you'd rather just type your question, I read it. I'm very happy to do so also. And nice to see some faces. And we do have someone from the Americans now. We've got Alison here from Brazil, which must be so early there. Welcome, Alison. Um, so, the first question that I have in the chat, hi Alison, nice to see the palm trees behind you, very different from Yorkshire. <laughs> um, the first question that I have in the chat are uh, um, uh, to, to Alistair. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll do them both together if that's okay, Alice. So the first one is about where does this platform comes from? I've put in the chat uh, the website of the Citizens Foundation, but if you could say a little bit about where these platforms come from. And then that's a question from me and uh, Walker. And then a question from Kate Wallace asking, saying, you've talked about how it, it, this interacts with legislation. Has it been used by select committees as well? And was that successful? And I know that committees in the Scottish Parliament, they do both, they do legislation and, yeah. and scrutiny. So Absolutely. if you could just say a little bit about that, Ali, and then I'll go to Derek. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. So in terms of the platforms, uh, one of my colleagues, Ailsa, is on the line as well. We worked, uh, oh God, four, five years ago uh, to um, look at, we, we have a process in the Scottish Parliament called the Digital Engagement Tools Team, which is like not an official uh, department, but more of a cross-departmental working group of colleagues that we knew that um, that yeah, started in 2017, thank you very much Elsa, uh, and it was to look at how digital tools can you know increase public participation in, in the work of Parliament and we did a long uh, ranging uh, process of both sort of horizon scanning and then we did some procurement but in not maybe in the traditional sense um, because what we focused on was uh, different types of um, the engagement processes that we wanted uh, digital tools to achieve. Um, so, for example, we wanted a, a consultation platform and then we also wanted a kind of debating platform. And rather than in normal procurement processes, it's very sort of uh, qualitative, it's very word based. Our platform is amazing because it can do this, it can do that. We actually wanted the providers to show us what that would be like. So the scoring for the procurement was based on uh, mock ups that the, the different um, providers would provide. And then through that process, we were then able to procure uh, these platforms and they're both available. They've got slightly different uh, models, um, but I've put them in the chat. Uh, Your Priorities is from the Citizens Foundation. That's a non-profit that is in, um, in Iceland. 
and then there's um the lib who provide um who provide citizen space that we that we use for our call for reviews process and uh, they, they, they provide software as a service so uh, that's all there but procurement is of course very important i would not i urge you just to just because we've done it and it looks quite cool um by all means investigate but also look at um you know what else is out there in the market and so on and if it fits your needs and um, in terms of yeah like select committees or, or or bill committees in the scottish parliament we're unicameral so we have 16 uh, committees and they have the role of uh all, like if a bill is uh, under their remit then they will look at it but then they could also do an inquiry into the subject matter we have used it for um like subject matter as well as just bills both of these platforms and um, so um for example um right now um, and maybe to bring in another one of our committees uh, we have a petitions committee uh, and the petitions committee has the power to um suggest that maybe a subject matter committee looks at something in more detail so right now there is a a petition on banning um greyhound racing in scotland um uh, and we we've used uh, your priority uh, so we've used citizen space to look at that recently and used very similar techniques to to look at the data that comes in because in the space of like two weeks we got uh, 1300 submissions so that's quite a lot to look at um and then for uh, your priorities we've done loads of work with um kind of subject matter committees looking at uh, for COVID-19 because everybody cares about or, about COVID and um, we needed a way to involve the public in that we were able to use the Your Priorities platform to generate questions and then the MSPs were able to look at the questions that were submitted and then ask them directly and because the platform hopefully you've seen in the very quick uh, presentation that I did that it's quite um, image and video heavy so we were able to show videos of the questions being asked and answered and it provided a really nice feedback loop um, and then yeah um, for um, yeah, citizen space, if there is a particular inquiry that's going on, of course, we can use the different answer components to, to ask questions about that. So we can perform all the different types of functions um, using these platforms. Thanks very much, Ali. Um, Derek, can you just say briefly uh, who, you, who you are and then yeah, just go ahead with your question. Yeah. Great. OK, Derek Dignam, um, Head of Comms in the Irish Parliament. Um, Hi guys, can I just first of all thank the two presenters because those two presentations were absolutely top notch, absolutely excellent. I really, really enjoyed them. It was, it was a well spent um, 30 minutes and I really appreciate it. We, we look, in the Irish Parliament, we looked at citizen space about three or four years ago, but we didn't have the resources in our committee secretariat to actually bring it into play. Um, we looked at the licensing agreement and all the rest of it, and they used it actually quite successfully in the Northern Ireland Assembly as well. So we were aware of that, and I, I thought it was a really nice piece of software. But it's just um, just a couple of questions, because I think what I'll do, I mean, after this, I think I'll probably try and um, link up with both presenters, because I, I would like to try and revive it in the in the Irish Parliament for my own for my own usage. But just a couple of questions, if I might, um, please, Christina. Um, just, Alistair, on the capacity of citizen space, like we heard from the New Zealand side that 106,000 was the highest number of submissions in. Does is citizen space capable of handling that level of submissions let's say i'm just just a kind of technical question then for um catherine i was wondering just on that you raised a very subtle point between around bias and transparency and i'm just it's a really really intriguing piece and it's absolutely superb that you're doing your own principles to 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 show members uh how you're how you're going to avoid that issue but can you just dive a little bit deeper in there how does transparency actually mitigate the bias just I, i'm struggling just to see how that because the bias would still come through so how do you actually how do you actually mitigate it just by transparency alone because the weight of the bias is still there within the submissions and just that point there was intriguing to me thank you very much yeah. really great questions derek i'll leave you on to go first and then Catherine. yeah um just in terms of capacity, um, it's, it's a really interesting question. Like the answer is yes, uh, but it's not just about the software. It's about the infrastructure that you've put in place in order to ensure that that's the case. Uh, the biggest um, ha submissions we've had is I think it was around 12,000. That was for the uh, gender uh, recognition reform um, things. We used similar processes um, to 
be able to to highlight the, the different viewpoints within that. Um, but there's a number of things to think about. One is around publishing of submissions. So generally, we um, have um, our, our clerks uh, will be able to, to publish submissions that are submitted. And usually these are, those are more of the detailed um, submissions. Um, that we, that we would publish as standard. And then the, the survey, we really wouldn't publish every single individual response because it's mainly quantitative, uh, but then we have the, the qualitative. And then, but then the challenge is more around then around looking at, yeah, the ability to, uh, to analyze. And again, we've got, um, a team of colleagues in space, but I'm sure Elsa, my colleague, will let me know that, you know, there's uh, 50 or so, is that right, Elsa, 50 um, uh, researchers there. And again, it depends on the amount of work that they they have on at any one time. So again, inquiry planning or scrutiny planning is really, really important to know what are you going to be asking for, to know what's coming back and being able to plan how within the time scale is allowed that you're able to process the, the, the data in an appropriate manner to make sure that the voices are heard and that the MSPs are able to use that uh, uh, appropriately. Thank you, Alec. Catherine, transparency and bias, that's something we talk so much about in ethics in research, but um, yeah, great question. Oh, I think that is, it's an excellent question. And I think my answer might sound quite circular in the fact that there's, uh, for a start, there's perceived bias. So the perceived, um, you know, there's a perception of bias. So for the transparency of sort of saying, this is what we did is one way to demonstrate I think that bias has been mitigated where possible so and I think by doing that transparency um, and by reporting on it it kind of forces the analysts to come back to those first principles and I think some of the principles around that is for example trying to come up with a collective view and a collective approach to how you might identify your themes or how you might, might um, identify things. So I think that the transparency of saying this is how you're going to do it is one way. It's, it's kind of like a way to keep us honest <laughs> and to show that we are adhering to those principles. And if we can, you know, in an ideal situation, if we can publish this is how we did the analysis and that could actually be replicable then you're demonstrating that bias has been mitigated as much as possible within your process I, I hope that answers the question it's food for thought <laughs> yeah <laughs> no it's a very it's a it's, oh look you know we've all levels of bias, conscious, unconscious, the whole lot. I mean, and, um, you know, it's a study on its own. But no, I just, I, I, I appreciate both answers. Absolutely excellent. And uh, no, it's just something we'll, we'll take a little bit further. But I, I'm just so delighted that you're you're doing your own standards and developing these kinds of ideas and using the uh, software in that way. So no, I really appreciate the answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. We could talk, be talking about that for a long time because it, it's something that in, in research we talk a lot about exactly that, the bias and how to mitigate for the bias. And it's mainly about evidencing it really, isn't it? That's the only way because you can't mitigate bias. Bias is just there. Um, yeah. there's, there's some great questions in the chat and we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to have to, to group them up a little bit. Um, I'll go for Jonathan Murphy's question. Um, I can see you, Jonathan, but you've typed it, so I presume you want me to read it. I, I can do it. Um, so Jonathan says, maybe I missed it, but I'm interested on how you measure the relative weight of different inputs. And I think um, you sort of touched on that with an issue, isn't it? For example, is it possible to organise thousands of inputs on controversial issues? Could this be the perspective of a dedicated minority, whereas most people might not share that perspective, but aren't highly motivated to organise on the issue, is there a risk that extreme perspectives on any side of an issue are overcounted for just because their supporters are organized? Yeah. Can I just bring in another question? Sorry, because we've got a few coming in, completely different, but really mm -hmm. important question. So maybe the first one, Ali, Ali, if you answer the first one, then Catherine, if you answer to this one, which is about what, what are the legal foundation policies and strategies to implement these technological reforms among MPs? 
So this is from Lumina Mentari, who I think is from Indonesia, but I might be getting that completely wrong, and I apologize, Lumina, if I am. Uh, but did you face any resistance or obstacles politically in implementing this process? So I think it's about, you know, the, uh, the members and the process you're actually implementing. So Ali, first, this issue from Jonathan. Uh, yeah, it's a really important one, Jonathan. <coughs> um, I think what I did mention in my presentation was that we make clear to members that this isn't a, you know, a, a stratified sample of public opinion and nor should it be seen that way. But then it, kind of in relation to sort of what we're talking about in terms of transparency and bias is that we're able to show people that are in favour of this bill um, are in favour of it for these reasons. People that are against this bill are against it for these reasons. And then it's all mapped out. Uh, we don't give a, um, an opinion on whether, you know, these people over here are correct or those people over there are correct. These are the opinions that they have. And then I suppose it would be up to the elected uh, members to, to make their decisions on that. Uh, I suppose then there comes the difficulties of, of politics, um, which um, obviously we as um, impartial uh, uh, officers, are, you know, don't, don't play a part in, but, you know, um, we we used it for GRR, and you can see quite clearly in the analysis of the of the of the, the gender recognition reform bill the different reasons that are given, and you can you know draw your own conclusions from from the information that people have provided, and indeed members did do that, and if it um, if it suited to their particular uh, process, maybe they would give certain weight to certain opinions rather than others. But I suppose that is when it kind of crosses the threshold from processing information that you've gathered from the public and then into the realm of um, political debate and discussion, uh, which we have got little influence over. Thank you, Ali. And Catherine, uh, briefly, please, sorry for, for rushing you, but I don't want to include others. So uh, reactions from politicians, uh, from um, members to these processes? Um, so I guess from from the New Zealand Parliament, the, the bit that we're putting in place now is the development of the standards. And we are um, doing that as part of the standing orders review. So in the New Zealand Parliament, the standing orders get reviewed every parliamentary term, which is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I mean, it's great, but it's a lot of work. And we, we're going through the um, standing orders review at the moment. And to be honest, it's kind of finding some things in the submissions and we, we're actually kind of sliding it in finding ways to um, tie it back to things that have been said in submissions to be able to get our standards, uh, to be able to get the committee to agree to the standards. And they have agreed for us to develop the standards. So I'm really, really happy about that. So it will, it, what, what that means is that it will go into the um, standing orders committee's report back to the House. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there, there always needs to be that buy-in, doesn't it, from the members, otherwise this process just don't work at all and they wouldn't um, follow them up and integrate them into their practice. So then I've got a question from, and I'm really sorry because I'm going to say the name completely wrong, but from Sade Symphony uh, from Laos, who asks a really important question, which is about closing the feedback loop. So uh, they ask, say, I'm interested in how your parliaments get back to submitters to get them informed, or what are the solutions for their submission? It is important in Leo's case that if a proper res responding to each submission, it's crucial to build trust to res be responsible to citizens' input. So about the closing the feedback loop, if you've got any reflections on that. And then a question from Zoe, what I think is in the London Assembly, I think, uh, but I might be completely wrong. Um, and, and, and so he says, that's right, right. <laughs> she says, coming from a very small team, uh, one issue for them is resources and time, which is one of the main problems with these tools, isn't it? Can you give a sense of how many people research is working in the projects that you have used here as an examples? Um, really brief questions, uh, answers, please, to both of these. So I think they're quite quick. And then we still have Thomas Gregory coming in, um, also from Laos. Ali. Um, yeah, getting back to submitters, um, we obviously now with these processes anyway, we're able to publish the, the analysis that we've done and we can make a decision about whether we email everyone directly um, that, that's taken part and we've done that 
or we're able to put it up on the same page where they've taken part. So that, that it, there's a kind of record of everything that, that that's happened. Uh, and that's had interesting results in terms of some people get back to you and go, what is this? And you're like, well, you engaged for like five minutes, four months ago on this uh, bill. And we we're just telling you what happened. And a couple of people were like, oh, oh, well, that's surprising. Thank you very much. Um, but because they weren't expecting it. Um, and then other ones, because it's quite a high profile um, bills, for example, then people are going to search out. So if we've got the information all there and we were quite nervous in some circumstances around publishing certain analysis because of the controversial nature, but because it's all published there and was presented in such a way that presents all sides of the argument, people were tended to be quite happy about the, the processes that were followed. Um, and then in terms of sizes, um, it could be as small as you've got your clerk that's leading a particular part of the project. You've got maybe myself from participation, digital engagement side of things, along with um, maybe a couple of colleagues supporting the digital engagement part. And then maybe two researchers from SPICE, one from a qualitative angle and one from uh, maybe a data visualization uh, mm -hmm. angle. And then actually though I'm going to increase it into things about communications and all that. But yeah, it could be that your initial team could be as small as about, you know, six or seven in relation to the different things you have to do. Yeah. And that connection to different services actually is the more important one, isn't yeah. it? Different people yeah. linking into the expertise that people have. Uh, Catherine, really briefly, sorry to rush you. Yep. No, fine. I, I think that um, my quick answer would be, I don't think we do a great job at getting back to submitters, to be perfectly honest. I don't think we do a really good job of coming back to the feedback loop. One of the things, because I think that our focus is always about the members, and I'm, and to be honest, I hope that as part of our principles-based approach, that that becomes a really important part of it, because um, I completely agree with you. I think it's a really important um, principle mm. to get back to submitters. In, in terms of teams, it was me doing my master's degree by myself in the weekends, and then I've kind of been doing presentations through throughout um, the office of the clerk and trying to get people on board with my ideas. And so it's been a long, slow process, yeah. but it's been great. People have been um, kind of really engaging with it. Yeah, I think the, the political acceptance of this and the process is probably more important than the actual size of the team than you do what you can do with the team from from the from my own research at least right last question i know there's more questions in, in in the chat and if you want to answer those in the chats please do but last question thomas gregory undp leo leos really really briefly thomas if that's okay of course thanks christina and thanks uh, to both presenters for these fascinating examples it reminds me of work i did in the australian parliament where we set up an online survey to try and direct very energetic uh, civil society on a really controversial topic around uh, child support, which is payments between parents after splitting up to support the, the caring of children. Um, I'd be interested if you can comment on how very energised members of the public responded to this, whether they felt like they were being pushed into answering questions in a particular way. Did it cut out the use of form letters where everyone sends the same submission that someone else has authored and you get a thousand copies of the same letter so i'm interested for those people who are kind of already really angry and really focused on these issues does it get them engaged or are they still suspicious um i, I mean I'll, I'll i'll take the gender recognition reform as an example yeah, a good example <laughs> yeah um, it's obviously very high profile and i have to stress that there's uh, now kind of high court action in relation to this further up the chain um but um because we gave people the choice either you can look at the detailed provisions of all i mean i can't ever many remember but people had the same idea as the case study i showed earlier thomas for grr they could look at all the provisions of the bill and they had that choice or they could give their um initial reaction to the different provisions and then a general statement and people generally were quite happy with that however there is this thing about um maybe they come out and say oh well um 60 of us were against this bill based on twelve and a half thousand people and um, so that means we are correct versus well is that actually uh, you know, is that is that is is that actually accurate in terms of public opinion, or it's more about the issues that are raised and how you can use that to uh, uh, scrutinise the bill, which I feel yeah. was done. So, yeah. yeah. Catherine, any final word on that? Or is that, are you happy? <clears throat> I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you so much because it's 10 o'clock now and I still want to say thank yous and all of that. But clearly we could have been here for the whole day, carry on talking about this. There's so much else we haven't talked about in terms of process and everything. 
Uh, but before I do my thank yous, just to say to everyone um, that in about a month's time on the 16th of May, we'll have another seminar touching on these issues, but focusing on different types of processes, different case studies. So we'll have presentations from the lower chamber and the upper chamber in Brazil. Actually, one of our speakers, Alison, is here today with us. So looking at um, how to process mass uh, input from citizens into parliamentary work, slightly different perspective. So I hope to see you all then. And Fiona has just put the link in the chat for that seminar on the 16th of May, 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, so that's GMAT plus one hour. If anyone wants more information on the Public Engagement Hub, again, Fiona will put the, the, the link in the chat. So you can go in there and see all the activities we're doing and all the seminars. And also any more information about IPEN itself, which is the International Parliament Engagement Network. If you want a deeper engagement with these issues, then um, you'll see the, the website in the chat on how you can join IPEN, or you can just attend these seminars if, if, if you just wish to attend the seminars rather than doing any more than that. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, you, I, th I think you all, everyone will agree that it was a great, great, great seminar with lots to talk about, we could go on forever. Thank you so much for the interpreters who do a fabulous job in keeping up with our speed of talking and different accents and um, doing a fantastic and essential job for us to be able to do these global seminars. And of course, thank you so much, Catherine and Ali. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think, you know, the enthusiasm for everyone demonstrates that. So then can you please join me in, in thanking Catherine and Alistair to by clapping online yourselves, however you want to do it. Um, and have a very good rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. <laughs>